This afternoon, I want to compare two modern times. That's not Charlie Chaplin's movie. Uh, as lived and witnessed and diagnosed from the most ancient cockpit of our Western civilization, which is the Roman papacy. The first modern times began at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, around 1815, and stretched all the way to the end of the Second World War, 1945. It gave birth, it gave to world history really three new things. During the long 19th century, there emerged on European soil modern nation states that look a lot like what they look today, and industrial science. And when you put the two together, there was an extraordinarily, there was realized an extraordinarily efficient way of organi organizing social and material forces. This modern times ended in the 20th century in two world wars in which those very same states, through industrial science, managed to destroy themselves. The crises of that modern times was primarily institutional. So for example, if we were to count up its failures, even its successes, but let's speak of its failures, we would list such things as monarchies and republics subject to nonstop assassination, civil wars and revolutions, alliances like the Central Powers and the Triple Entente, international conventions such as the League of Nations, Wall Street and speculative finance, modern agriculture, which turned out to be disastrous, especially in North America, with the Dust Bowl, churches, colony, slavery, child labor, we could keep going. Just as a brief tour of 1815 to 1945, people would have spoken of its crises chiefly in institutional terms. The second modern times began after World War II. And now it seemed that some of the lessons of the institutional crises had been learned. Some of them were actually fixed. So for example, we have not had another world war or another great depression since 1945. Still others were fixed, not so much on the ground, but at least in the domain of ideas. So for example, the proposition that constitutional democracy is the least dangerous form of government is widely held that there are human rights justiciable in courts of law is a notion that's widely held. But for reasons I will explain, the crisis of this modern times, which is ours, is not institutional but anthropological, for it can reach no consensus about human nature. Or to put it slightly differently, it believes that the absence of consensus about what is human nature is either an inconsequential thing or a very good thing indeed, which is only another way of saying that the crisis of our modern times is that it cannot comprehend its own peril. And this problem has no institutional fix. Bestriding both of these modern times stood two great pontificates that of Leo XIII and John Paul II. Leo was the first pope to be born in the 19th century and the first to die in the 20th. Born in 1810, dies in 1903. Elected exactly one century after Leo's election to the papacy, 1878 to 1978, JP II is the first pope to be born in the 20th century and the first to die in the 21st. These two pontificates together amounted to 52 years. But even more telling is the fact that measured from Leo's birth in 1810 to John Paul II's death in 2005, the lived experience of these two men with only a 17 year interval encompass all of the modern times worth remembering. From Napoleon to the iPhone, Papal States to the Austrian Empire, JP2's father served in the Habsburg Army. 
Austrian Empire to European Union, Our Lady of Lords to Lady Gaga. <laughs> All of modern times is in the life of these two men. It's quite remarkable. Now, separated by exactly one century, the pontificates of Leo and JP II parallel each other in some ways that are quite uncanny. And before I talk about the differences, it's interesting to lay down some of the similarities. And the first is of paramount importance. They were both conciliar popes. The Catholic Church went for 300 years without an ecumenical council after Trent and then had two in the space of two generations. In Leo's case, that council was Vatican Council I that uh, began in December 1869 and adjourned somewhat suddenly in July 1870. European governments threatened to intervene militarily to stop this council even before it began. For the council first deliberated about and then actually legislated two things most feared by the kings and cabinets of 19th century Europe. First, the doctrine of papal infallibility, and two, the doctrine of universal jurisdiction of the Holy See, which meant that there could be no intermediary powers between the pope and the bishops of the world. In effect, the church had reconfigured itself along the lines of a modern state, endowed with sovereignty, but a rather extraordinary case of sovereignty because ecclesiastical sovereignty violated two of the most fundamental principles of modern sovereignty. First, the church was transnational, and so it was not dependent upon territoriality. And second, the church had its own magistrates and citizens in every other sovereignty. Imperium in imperio, as Bismarck complained about this council in 1870. The doctrine of infallibility covered not only matters of faith, but also some fundamental matters of morality. And by and large, European states of the late 19th century, although they eschewed matters of divine revelation, unlike our democracies today, did not hes hesitate to legislate morality. They were in public morality business, and they saw Vatican Council I, therefore, as a threat to their moral culture, the doctrine of papal infallibility, and to the political system of nation states, the Church, uh, the Holy See claiming universal jurisdiction. After another very troubled century that included two world wars, a depression, a cold war, the Second Vatican Council commenced in the fall of 1962 under what at first seemed to be a rather serene and confident atmosphere. If at the First Vatican Council the church became a kind of ecclesiastical porcupine lodged in the dangerous neighborhoods of nation states, nearly the opposite attitude marked the documents of the Second Council. Now the church announces its openness to the modern world and described itself more in the fashion of a cultural and religious people than an ecclesiastical state. And it's quite remarkable that these two councils, which situated the church so differently in modern history, were separated by less than a full generation. That is, the senior bishops at Vatican II were seminarians in the 1890s under Leo XIII, well, including uh, 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 Pius XII was a seminarian. John XXIII was a seminarian in the 1890s. These two popes were also conciliar because each in his respective council brought the right experience for leadership in the council. As Archbishop of Perugia for nearly 30 years, Bishop Pecci, eventually Leo XIII, held his diocese together despite constant harassment by the laicist Italian government, which had confiscated ecclesiastical properties and sporadically imposed a kind of martial law on church liberties. And even in this kind of situation, Archbishop Pecci found the time to teach philosophy and theology. He was a philosopher bishop. And he launched the neo-scholastic movement while a bishop of Perugia. 
founding what was then called the Perusian Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas, which after his selection as Pope, he called the Roman Academy, and still later called the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas. It was the think tank for almost all of those great encyclicals that came from Rerum Novarum all the way through Pius XII. It was, it was founded under conditions of martial law in Perugia. For his part, Cardinal Archbishop Wojtyla brought to the Second Vatican Council Episcopal experience that was honed under very tough political circumstances, Poland under communism. But he also brought his training and experience as a teacher and an author of philosophy and theology. So we have two popes who were philosopher bishops. Both had spent a considerable amount of time defending church liberty against hostile governments. These two popes together represent, practically speaking, the magisterial voice on natural law, for example. I figure more than 75% of all magisterial statements ever uttered on the subject of natural law can be attributed to these two popes. You say, how could that be? Why were these two popes given 2,000 years of history? Well, besides the fact that both were Thomists of a certain sort, the answer is the meteoric rise of natural law teaching by the Roman magisterium corresponds to the demise of political Christendom. No longer able to command temporal magistrates as sons or as right arms of the church, the magisterium appealed to conscience for the recognition of basic principles of higher law. Natural law discourse in the way we know it is not a medieval discourse. It's a quite modern one that the church adopted in order to speak to the world without any power to command it. Finally, I call them conciliar popes because each in turn devoted his pontificate to interpreting and consolidating the teachings of their respective council. For his part, Leo had to rec reconcile Vatican I with modernity or at least as that term would have been understood in the 19th century. It meant, at the very least, two things. Science, or sciences, because by the time Leo was elected in 1878, we have now natural science, we have social science, and we have economics by 1878. Uh, in 1864, Pope Pius IX had issued his Syllabus of Errors, right, which contained 80 erroneous propositions that have to be negated as being not true. And the famous or notorious 80th proposition stated, the Roman pontiff can and ought to reconcile himself and come to terms with progress, liberalism, and modern civilization. Well, in the first year of his pontificate, Leo issued Aeterni Patris on the harmony of faith and reason, and trying to work out terms of that reconciliation. And the church, he said, is a domus sapientiae, a house of wisdom, having a twofold pedagogy of philosophy and theology. So Leo dropped the technique or the tactic of dealing with modernity by syllabus of errors and condemnations. By the way, he had to, because with the loss of political Christendom, you can't just issue condemnations, because you have no police to enforce them. Condemnations belonged to Paris in the 13th or 14th century, right? Not to Berlin in the late 19th century. So in place of condemnations, Leo writes 110 encyclicals. Right. Teaching on everything from the division and method of the sciences to principles of polity. The second thing that would have marked modernity for someone in the late 19th century was simply political sovereignty, science and political sovereignty. And the monopolistic terms of the nation state at that time not only left in doubt the public status of the church, but also that of other societies from marriage and family life to labor unions. And so Leo devoted his teaching also to distinguishing and harmonizing diverse social forms. Vatican I was an easy council to deal with for Leo, because Vatican I only issued two documents, 
Vatican II produced 16. And the intellectual, doctrinal, and even pastoral threads connecting these documents were rather loosely woven. And as we know, bishops and theologians disagreed about the spirit and the letter of these documents. The De Declaration on Religious Liberty, for example, was widely considered discontinuous with church teaching, and that was deemed very good by some and very treasonous by others. Important and influential theologians made the Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, a mere footnote to the document on the Church in the modern world, Gaudium et Spes, as though the Catholic Church was formally constituted and defined by its relation to the world. Right? John Paul had the tougher job. He set out very quickly to try to make sense of the documents of the Council, especially Lumen Gentium, the doctrine of the church, and Gaudium et Spes, the church in the modern world. Okay, now, from institutional to anthropological crisis. I'm gonna use broad strokes, which I have to do at this time in the afternoon under a time limit. When Leo became pope, he turned his attention very quickly to the problems posed by modern states these state-making regimes, which emerged after the Napoleonic Wars and by the late 19th century, were, the wind was at their backs. Okay. Uh, these states viewed the social institutions of the church with great suspicion. Sacramental marriage, family schools, associations, dioceses, religious orders were all rivals to the new anthropological and political creed of man and citizen. It swept out of France in the French Revolution. This creed of liberty, equality, and fraternity considered the human person under fraternity chiefly as a citizen in the state. All other fraternities, natural or supernatural or customary, were deemed legitimate only if given a concession by the state that is permitted legally by the state. In other words, the state sought to create a monopoly over society and human friendship. And so Leo set out to defend social pluralism, that friendship in fraternity is a multi-dimensioned sort of activity he never used the term social doctrine for what he was doing. Pius XI is the first one to refer to social doctrine in uh, 1931. But if you had asked Leo to define what he means by social doctrine, he would say it's a doctrine about institutions. There are diverse forms and modes of authority about the mixed things that overlap different institutions and authorities. It's about social movements which motivate changes in institutions, but it's about institutions for Leo. In all of Leo's magisterial letters, the church speaks as an institution. And in every one of them, every one of them is formally directed to members of institutions. There's no such thing until the early 1960s as encyclicals that say, to all men of goodwill. If you look at the salutations and to whom the letters are directed in the late 19th century, they're always to institutions or representatives of institutions. That is, men, not qua men, but members of the apostolic college, superiors of religious orders, regional patriarchs, and in two important but unusual cases, to laities as members of the church and citizens of France. It was not until 1963 in Pachamon Terrace until an encyclical is directed to human beings qua human beings, bereft of any institutional identity. So in the thickness of history, Leo began this long process of trying to sort out all of the social and political debris of that era of re revolutions and formation of nation states. And the institutional situation was truly a mess. For example, when Leo was born, 
One pope had been kidnapped and soon died in French captivity, and another was being held in French captivity. That was Pius VI and Pius VII. Three archbishops of Paris had been murdered during Leo's lifetime. A year before his death, yet another French government shut down more than 2,000 Catholic schools. At the time of the revolution, 1789, there were 2,500 Benedictine abbeys in Europe. By the time Leo became Archbishop of Perugia, only 30 remained. In 1789, there were 25,000 Dominicans. When Leo was elected pope, there was 3,300. Half of the Prussian hierarchy was in prison when Leo was elected during Bismarck's Kulturkampf. It was an institutional mess for the church. Uh, Leo's frame of reference was very traditional on institutions. There are three great institutions which by nature or grace are necessary for human happiness. Marriage, family, polity, and church. And for Leo, the human being is a matrimonial, a political, and an ecclesial animal. These institutional theaters or seats of human happiness are interrelated, and the moral decline or confusion over one necessarily causes decline and confusion in the other. And Leo's teaching pontificate is basically to try to harmonize the three great institutions, but also voluntary associations as well. But even the defense of voluntary organizations, like in Rerum Novarum with unions, isn't defense of the family, essentially, because the justification for uh, uh, bargaining of labor is in defense of the natural law obligation of the father to provide for the family. Here's the telling point about the primacy of the Roman, to the Roman mind of the social institutional questions of that older modern times. The inaugural encyclical of every pope from Pius VI to Paul VI, that is from 1775 to 1963, dealt with the theological political problem. Every single inaugural encyclical. What was on their mind was the problem of the state and its rather sharp elbows with regard to the rest of society. Had John Paul II started his pontificate in this mold, surely his first encyclical would have addressed the political situation in Poland and in Eastern Europe. Indeed, a pope from the most politically fraught sector of Europe would have something to say right away about institutions along the Vistula River. Instead, he issued redemptor homines. Not on the problem of the state, but rather on Jesus Christ as salvator homines, savior of man. So here is where the shift, an important shift is happening from institutional questions to anthropological questions. Where his predecessors asked, what is Caesar? Redemptor homines begins with the question posed by Psalm 8. What is man? In answer to which, Psalm 8 says, you have given him rule over the works of your hands. The human being is an image bearer cooperating with God through his own action. And to the question, what is man, John Paul II answered, participated royalty. In his first trip to Poland after being elected pope, he called the, Pol the Poles piasts, that is sovereigns or better translated, those who are crowned. So too in his trip to Cameroon, he referred to the African youth as being crowned according to Psalm 8. He doesn't write an encyclical on the state until 1991. He waits 13 years to do that. In the meantime, his attention is given to the problems of theological anthropology. So in Redemptor Hominis 1979, he proposes to discern what are the signs of these times, 
And he says, the most important signs are not the external works of modern men, that is, the organization of the state of science and technology, but man in flight from himself in fear of the very works of his own dominion. In Dives in Misericordiae, the very next year, 1980, John Paul discusses God's rule made visible in the creature. And once again, he goes back to Genesis to see how human dominion makes visible the rule of the Father. And then to the Gospels to expound the relationship between justice and mercy in divine rule. And his final encyclical on the Trinity, Dominus et Vivicatum, 1986, he comments on the passage in Gaudium et Spes, when God is forgotten, the creature itself becomes unintelligible. That is, human rule is obscured without the creator because it's the vocation of an image bearer to rule with God, both by created nature and habilitation of grace. In Laborum Exercens, he discusses the acts proper to an image bearer, dominion over material creation and moral rule, precisely as a subject who rules himself, who acts and decides, a creature who is provident both for himself and for others. And all of these thin themes of image bearing, participation, kingly predicates of self-rule were explored in the very lengthy series of Wednesday audiences, 1979-84, which come to us as Theology of the Body, under that title. John Paul had initiated a profound change in Catholic orientation of Catholic social doctrine from the institutional to the anthropological before he ever wrote an encyclical on the state, which is Sanctasium Rosanus. And I think this was affirmed by Benedict XVI, who said in Caritas and Veritate, we need to affirm today the social question has become a radically anthropological question. So what is the question? It's my conclusion. From his earliest dramatic works, written in Krakow during German occupation, 39 to 45, all the way to his 1976 Lenten conferences given for Pope Paul VI, shortly before his own election to the papacy, Karl Wojtyla increasingly came to believe that the crisis of the 20th century is anthropological. And the distinctive mark of the age is what Wojtyla's friend and colleague, Rocco Buttiglione, aptly calls negative anthropology. What is negative anthropology? It's the ready affirmation of what man is not combined with a deep-seated reluctance to affirm normative anthropological content. It's not an esoteric philosophy or ideology, according to Wojtyla. It's an experiential and practical option familiar to all relatively wide awake human persons of the 20th century. We're all in this gig. A ready denial of what man is not. I mean, ready affirmation of what man is not, very deep reluctance to say what he is. At the Second Vatican Council, Foytiwa worked on the anthropological sections for the pastoral constitution, Gaudium et Spes. And in, in a debate over that document, how that document should address atheism, Foytiwa insisted that atheism is not merely an academic, ideological, or political system. It should not be viewed simply as the institution of state Marxism. Atheism, rather, he said, is a problem of the human person. The human being who is an atheist, he said, is one persuaded of his own end, if I may so speak, of his eschatological aloneness. Wojtyla's intervention moved the drafters to distinguish between the external or systematic aspects of atheism, what I'm going to call the institutional aspects of it, in departments of philosophy or in Marxist states or whatever, to distinguish all of those from the anthropological premises of it. 
Wojtyla was convinced that the exaltation of human beings as Adam through the negation of human natural and religious aspects has a mythic structure that overlaps with and subverts what sacred scripture appoints, uh, uh, reports about the frontier of Adam who knows what he is not. He's not God or a beast. Adam knows what he's not, according to scripture. And according to Vilfoytiwa's reading of scripture, looking at the data of modern culture, this negation, I know what I'm not, this negative moment becomes the principal item of interest for the 20th century. Indeed, this negative moment becomes the experience to be universalized. One or another aspect of the premise that human nature is radically indeterminate was known long before the 20th century. In fact, many theorists of the philosophers of the Enlightenment were quite taken with it. That is, if human nature is radically indeterminate, such that we know what we're not, but we don't know what we are, uh, who is able to command human beings? And many Enlightenment theorists, Rousseau, for example, and Hobbes as well, would say, authority must make its appearance. Ab is the voice of man, the voice of a divine-like human legislator. But given the fact that nature imparts no titles to rule, on what ground can this man issue a binding word? And the answer is, no one can issue a binding word. But we can give our consent. That is, we can give our consent by commanding a commanding voice, and that's the state. So the older response to anthropological indeterminacy was institutional. And this is nothing other than the artificial man who determines, who is determinate in every aspect by positive law. If this is a liberal regime, order is made determinate, but not so determinate that natural individuals lose their freedom to make themselves to be whatever they choose to be. As the French philosopher Pierre Manon puts it, human nature is a cipher, an efficacious indetermination, allowing a zone of liberty in which the individual can affirm himself without knowing himself. And this was the grand institutional solution to negative anthropology once upon a time. The state has made the determinate person having the kingly predicates of rule, while individuals enjoy efficacious indetermination, that is pure liberty, to be what they want to be. It's the best of world, both worlds. This is having your cake and eating it too. In his 1976 Lenten conferences, Wojtyla observed that modern anthropology transplants the Prometheus myth into the soil of Genesis. Right? He told Paul VI in these conferences, one cannot understand either Sartre or Marx without having first pondered very deeply the first three chapters of Genesis. And what do we learn if we consider the first three chapters of Genesis is the undergirding for the premise of negative anthropology, that man is an unknown being, that man is alone and his greatness requires him to be so. Okay. Here was the problem. The wars of the 20th century brought this state, the artificial man, the fully determinate man, into question. In 1945, any notion of the state having a monopoly over social institutions is quickly and decisively abandoned. This artificial construct, the state, state as sovereign, proved disastrous. It destroyed individual liberty and many other good things that individuals might freely choose. The Protestant theologian Karl Barth called the post-World War II time the era of disillusioned sovereignty. The underlying premise or attitude of negative anthropology therefore had to make a different turn. Namely, that the predicates of sovereignty once given to the state had to be transferred back to individuals in the name of human rights. But what's the status of the individuals who enjoy human rights if their freedom is based on radical in, radically indeterminate human nature? 
The answer is freedom itself, a fluid self capable of revising its own rights. And that's the crises of modern times for Wojtyla. The older times at least had an institutional stopgap, a patchwork of a solution. Negative anthropology needs a fully determinate state to oversee it. This is the crisis discerned by John Paul II. And let's imagine, to conclude, this great project of repairing institutions after the Second World War. And people learned, once again, the need to limit state sovereignty according to constitutional democracy, bills and charters of basic rights adjudicated by independent judiciaries. People relearn the importance of private property, market economy regulated by the rule of law and directed to the well-being of society. People relearn the notion that we need a clear and reciprocally enforced distinction between church and state. People learn that international assemblies with some authority are needed to check unilateral declarations of war and to make modest but real interventions in cases of humanitarian crises. People relearn the importance of voluntary associations, both within domestic regimes and across jurisdictional lines. People seem to have learned all of the institutional lessons. It's not rocket science. Now, it may be true that much of the world doesn't put it into practice, but it's not rocket science. Anyone who wills to do it has only to Google it to find out what's to be done. In other words, that old Leonine problem of the institutional crises, the fixes succeeded, more or less. The lessons of history were learned. But at the moment of its success, another problem was afoot that had not been anticipated. Namely, that negative anthropology would become the default philosophy of the culture. For example, that the three institutions necessary for human happiness, marriage, family, polity, and church, would become merely optional. And they are today, in much of the Western world, optional. If you can find something that belongs to government, you can outsource. Go ahead and do it. I mean, it's the. That government does it is merely optional. So in our times, we really can imagine polity, marriage, and church not as normative and formative institutions of life through which human beings acquire perfections over generations, so much as instruments that can be used to live a life of our own choosing, if we so choose. Negative anthropology renders the three great institutions of human happiness platforms for self-revision but not for a perfection of a nature. Today, it wouldn't be the three great institutions, but market is the prime analogy today for what it means to be human. This is what JP2 discerned about our modern times. And what he discerned is not amenable to institutional solutions. It affects all of the institutions, but it's not the kind of act crisis that can be fixed by a five-year plan. What are you going to do? Dial 9-11-9-1-1 and call the police on negative anthropology or something, you see? It's on the inside. It's not just on the outside. And there's almost nothing in, in the domain of law or public policy that can touch it. And we talk today about culture wars, which suggest taking a citadel by force but it's completely to misunderstand the anthropological crisis because it's not a citadel. It's the opposite of a citadel, and it's on the inside. And so, therefore, remedies to this are very difficult for us to consider, especially for those of us who are educated because we are the creatures and perpetrators of institutional solutions. But the crises of modern times identified by John Paul II will take heroic patience to resolve. <laughs>
and we're dealing now to invoke the metaphor of Pope Francis, with field hospitals in which the ministers are not so different than the patients. Maybe I should do a coda. On, well, I'll, I'll leave that for the questions, where Francis fits into this. Let me wrap it up. Thank you.